This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 119. Recorded on January 14th, 2016. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Uh, hi there. Hey, are you enjoying winter? Is it snowing like crazy out there? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, last week it snowed down to about 4,000 feet. <laughs> 70 degrees and sunny in San Diego, right? Yeah, sure. But, you know, we had we had a whiff of El Nino and yeah. considerable rain. Oh, yeah. And the good news is that the snowpack in the Sierras is about what it should be. Oh, good. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Is it snowing there? Uh, no. It's, it's a little bit cold, but um, the sun is out, so... Yeah, it's uh, cloudy here and one degree Celsius. It's chilly here in New yeah. York City. I was going to ask Elio if he misses the snow and the cold weather. I bet I could predict his answer, <laughs> right? I would vote no. When I left Chicago to go off to post docking in New York, there was less snow on Long Island. And then I left Long Island to come here and I have lost my snow shovel forever. So you and never get snow in Charleston? Twice in the 25 years I've lived here. Wow. And so, it so, literally lasts hours and not, you measure snow by hours, not inches. <laughs> how long it lasts as opposed to how much there is. You you all set, Elio? Yep. Beautiful. Bella, bella. I fatto bella. Grazie mille. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of millions. <laughs> millions. That's a good segue. A, <laughs> we, maybe that should be the title. <laughs> Speaking of millions. Thinking of millions. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. like that. It's actually billions, right? It's bi a trillions, actually. Trillions. Yeah, 10 to the 13th is... Uh, well, it's, it's, it's 10 trillion. 10 trillion. It's, yeah, 10 trillion. It's, it's a trillions, though, yeah. It's a trillion. Well, what we're referring to is the snippet that uh, Michael's going to tell you all about right now. It, it's really a, a fascinating concept, and, and I got this paper from one of my master's students who happens to be sitting in on the medical microbiology class I'm teaching this semester. And I began the lecture by introducing – it's a mixed class of dental students and master's students. So I began with the wonder of microbiology, and I threw out this fun fact that I thought was a fact, namely that the number of microbial cells on us and in us – when you compare it to our own human cells is uh, a tenfold difference, 10 microbes for every one human, that magic 10 to one ratio. Well, this is a good sign for the youth of America. The graduate student reads <laughs> and one of the, he, he sent me an email after that lecture and he stumbled onto an article by Ed Young, who is a staff writer at the Atlantic magazine who wrote a post or wrote a piece and reviewed a preprint of an article that was posted on the BioRx4 beta preprint server for biology that's hosted by Cold Spring Harbor. So you can go out and you can take a look at this paper. And the review was that uh, Ed Young reviewed was by Ron Sender, Shai Fuchs, and Ron Milo from the Weissman Institute of Science – and uh, they offer a re-derivation of this commonly accepted view that microbes outnumber humor cells by an order of magnitude. And so their title of the review is Nothing Magical, Revised Estimates for the Number of Human and Bacterial Cells in, in the Body. Mr. Young's fascinating treatment of this review in The Atlantic, he starts out and he gives – he reminded me that our fellow podcasters, Elio and Stan Malloy, were once the fact checkers of this fact, <laughs> where, they, where they learned that the 10 to 1 ratio could be traced back to a 1970 paper by the microbiologist Tom Lucky. And with no supporting evidence, uh, Dr. Lucky estimated that there were about 100 billion microbes in a gram of intestinal content, fluid or feces. 
in a thousand grams of such contents in the average adult, yielding this magical number, a hundred trillion or 10 to the 12, 100 times 10 to the 12 microbes. So Ed and Stanley also credit, and it was Stanley and Alios Post, they also credit the eminent microbiologist Dwayne Savage, who then took this figure and literally ran with it without evidence, it seems, in 1977. And he contrasted these 100 trillion microbes. So the 100 trillion microbes to keep the fractions in your head is the numerator. And then he contrasted against the 10 trillion cells in our body, which is, of course, the denominator. And uh, this was a figure that was harvested from a textbook. And as many of us know, textbooks rarely have references assigned to their fun facts. And so what this review is, is basically, if you will, a scavenger hunt to figure out where these numbers come from and whether or not there's any real evidence associated with these data. So when I saw this paper and uh, saw Ed's Atlantic article, and then I read the primary source that was up on the Cold Spring Harbor server, I then sent a note to to Stanley. And Dr. Malloy wrote back to us. I, I think the data are, are very squishy. Now, I think he was referring back to this 10 to 1 number. And Stan wrote in his email back to me, when people started emphasizing the 10 to 1 or 100 to 1 number that was influenced by Dwayne Savage, and then he brought out my old friend Abigail Sailors, as being one of the early proselytizers of this fact. It was largely intended, I think, to convince people out there that at that time that the normal flora that we now have transitioned to calling the microbiome is very important. And this in itself is not such a convincing argument because sometimes relative numbers are simply because there is a suitable niche and doesn't necessarily reflect or indicate the relative importance to the habitat. And as Stan points out, that's commensalism versus mutualism. So as we go through this little snippet or discussion, I want you to think back to what the subtle difference between commensalism and mutualism is. And I think from the data that we have under our belt today with the microbiome, we're going to appreciate that really the microbiome is really a mutual relationship between the microbe and the host because the microbe is actually doing so many critical jobs for us, uh, whether it be making something as simple as a vitamin or whether it's being able to influence uh, whether or not we want to eat that candy bar or chocolate uh, that many of us many of us crave. So the key points of this review are the authors first offer that the total number of bacteria in the reference man, and I should point out that man refers not to humans but men because there's a little bit of a squishy factor in women because in general women aren't as tall as men and they don't have the same surface area and volume, and so their numbers are a little bit lower. And so they think – that there's approximately 3.9 times 10 to the 13 bacteria, and that has an uncertainty of about 25% and a variation over the population of 52%. And then the largest number of human cells we identify, the dominant ones are, of course, the hemopoietic ones, namely our red blood cells. And this hemopoietic lineage, the, all the blood cells, whether they be red or white, uh, account for about 90% of our, our human cells. And so they revised past estimates to reach this magical total goal of 3 times 10 to 13 human cells and the 70 kilogram reference man. And the reference man is 170 centimeters in height. So for those of you who are not metric friendly, that's about 154 pounds. It's me. And our friends (laughs) in the United Kingdom, that's 11 stones. And the height, (laughs) 
<laughs> is five feet seven inches. It's me. I'm the reference man. Or hey, six, how about that? I knew and, it all along. <laughs> or sixteen point seven. Paradigm. Hands. The paradigm of humanity. Is Vincent, Vincent. Racaniello. <laughs> Il paradigma di humanità, Vincenzo Racaniello. So well, maybe that could be our title. So if you did this with a reference woman, you'd probably get the same ratio, right? Yes, you would, would get, get the same uh, ratio. About the same, and, yeah. Yeah. and I, I think but, it's it's but, all you know, about. I didn't know that we had that many red blood cells, but you know, you could. I let's say you want to argue. You could argue that red blood cells are very simple, same. Single-minded cells mm. they don't have a nucleus. They only do one thing, and they're almost not cells. So, if you wanted to call it, talk about the ratio of nucleated cells, that's very different. And to one is still good. That's right. Ten to one is still good, and that's Elio just got to the take-home message: where the microbes still outnumber us by ten to one because the red blood cell lacks that all-important. <laughs> ability to change. Now it does a very important thing. Remember the function of the red blood cell is to carry iron, to carry oxygen around in an iron box. And then it releases the oxygen from the iron box only when it needs it because oxygen of course is the evil molecule. That's, that's very taxing. Mm, it's still a cell, right? It's still a cell. And so, mm. you know, it's, it's, it goes back to what some of the medical students accuse me of occasionally is asking them how many angels can fit on a head of a pin. And I learned from one medical enterprising medical student, <laughs> the number is 12. Oh, That's really? how many. <laughs> well, I, I offhandedly asked, at, as, asked that question once and some enterprising medical student says the number is 12 and I have it on good authority from my guardian angel. And so, uh, <laughs> so, What's really interesting about the way the authors took apart this 10 to 1 ratio, and it's, it's really a clever way of doing this scavenger hunt, is they sought the scientific facts to critically revisit the 10 to 1 estimate that is now, for lack of a better word, considered dogma. And so they first asked, where are the microbes and how many are there? And so they teach us how they came apart, took this apart, and they, they looked in usual places of where we find lots of bacteria. We, of course, know that um, the colon or our large intestine has a tremendous number of bacteria, uh, typically 10 to the 11th uh, per mil, and they teach us how to verify that that number isn't just pulled out of the air. They teach us how large the colon is in the average man, and what's really clever is some of the methodologies that the early authors in the 70s didn't have because this was the days before the MRI. And we know from magnetic resonance scanning that the MRI can actually measure volumes because we see it all the time with measuring tumor volumes and doing all sorts of magical things with the MRI. We now know what those volumes really are. So the estimate is actually uh, getting a little better in terms of figuring out to a, a level of precision. Uh, one of the facts that I'm going to use as I begin to introduce the significance of the oral microbiome to my students is that while the bacterial concentrations in something that all dentists worry about, namely saliva and dental plaque are high because of its small volume, the overall numbers of bacteria in the mouth represent less than 1% of the colonic content of, of microbes. And they, and they take us through, but the really big place that the microbes seem to be hanging out is that large intestine and colon. And it's because of its volume and, and they're really packed to significant density. Let, me, let yes. me make a point. Let me interrupt you for a second and make a point that I don't you often see. When you think about the colonic content, there are really uh, many compartments, but you can divide them into roughly into two. The liquid one, which is the proximal part, the part which is nearer away from the anus and the rectum, and the part which is in largely in the descending colon and in the rectum, which is going on to making feces. Uh, I call that process, by the way, thoropoiesis. Okay. So, oh, so Elio. <laughs> I know. Anyhow, but think about it. Once they, you start making 
a fecal mass, T-U-R-D, uh, that is sequestering the bacteria away from the body. Right, it they're effectively much so, they become almost a solid, the contents of which we know daily. And it seems to me that that does not contribute to the interaction with the, with, with the human body. It's, it's, it's sequestered away and, you know, distributed outwards every day. So in reality, I'm arguing against the number of bacteria being as high as, as we think of it because the bacteria in the fecal content itself, once it's dehydrated into feces, mm -hmm. Almost don't count anymore. Yeah, that's it, right. and it's at the watering effect. And the so a fun exercise that some of our listeners may want to do is they give you the facts. An adult human is reported to produce about 147 grams of wet weight of stool per day, and the normal colonic transit time is about uh, 34 hours. And so. When you get a volume estimate of 147 grams of stool, a transit time of 34 hours, you, you effectively are removing 200 mils of materials. Well, from, but also, it's much more concentrated there. No, it's the more concentrated. The number of bacteria and feces is bound to be ha heavier than in the liquid content of the colon. Right, and so you so, can do you know, the it's, it's more than the, more than just by weight. It's a substantial amount of the whole microbiome. Right, you're absolutely correct, and I, I think looking at the take home message for me a, after Elio has interjected that we we factor out the cells without nuclei, and then we factor out the colon. Maybe the estimate is no longer 10 to 1, but maybe it's in some less significant 1 to 1 type of ratio. And what were really the important aspects is looking at the networking, how the microbes are interacting with the host. And it goes back to what um, Dr. Malloy was, was suggesting in his email is this mutualistic relationship between the microbes. And it's not necessarily raw numbers. It's really what they're doing and more importantly, when they're sure. doing it and how sure. they are reacting. Right. And so in reality, I mean, we, we, I think we've got, we've really got carried away by the number 10 to one. We did. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is really. It and really doesn't matter. It's one to one. That's I'm just as happy with one to one as I would be too with 10 to one or one to 10. It's still very large numbers of bacteria are involved, very large number of cells are involved. There's an opportunity for huge numbers of interactions. And the, the actual figure is not, you know, I'm not hung up on that. No. And as Stan pointed out, I think when Dr. Sailors was beginning to proselytize this, this fun fact, is she really wanted to drive home the importance of this living, if you will, our, our new organ system, because many people today are really looking at the microbiome as our newest organ-based system because they are doing the equivalent of yeah. an organ. It really doesn't matter how many are there. And in reality, I'm comforted by the fact that it's in a one-to-one -one ratio because then I can consider it's like an organ like the skin, like the heart, like the brain. That's a good um, point. And yeah, so that's a nice it, it, point. It, it really makes makes sense. And so, so as we recognize this relevant importance of the micro, and let's not forget the virome, and I, I made up a new word called the immunome, we know we will need to take into consideration the numbers as we try to interpret the fine papers that are coming out that are giving us not only who is there, but how many are there. And for better or worse, this number and type is what we can measure today. I think the future and really the promise of the microbiome is really going to be about these interactions. And so numbers matter, but we really need to figure out the tools to begin to dissect it. And so that's why I commend this paper to your attention because they have tables and figures that give you the fun facts of how to do some of these calculations. And the authors introduced a term that I, I really 
uh, love that they they wrote this down. They called it a sanity check of their uh-huh. data. This this <laughs> concept of do the numbers make sense? And it's really a, a way of of looking at how the numbers are really laying out. And I don't think anybody really objected to this 10 to 1. I don't think anyone's going to get really bent out of shape over 1 to 1. I think it's it's all about whether or not the data makes sense. And that's why I think this paper is interesting because of how the authors trace back these off-the-cuff remarks that people sometimes make in a discussion without being appropriately referenced or fact-checked by the reviewers. And they lay out how they went out and, and checked on these things. The other interesting things in their methods is they um, used uh, geometric means when they were reporting the number of bacteria per gram of wet stool or on the skin. And remember, the geometric mean is a type of mean or average, if you will, which indicates the central tendency that you're going to see this value in a set of numbers. And the way it's simply calculated is it uses uh, the products of their values and then you take the average of that as opposed to the arithmetic mean, which simply uses their sum. So I think that's another important distinction of this method is they're teaching us how to look at these numbers in a way – and they're also playing with calculations. They give the inventory of human cells and they talk uh, at length about the six types of cells that comprise the total human cell count to about um, the high 90th percentile. And then there's 50 other cell types that account for the remaining 3%. So if you're uh, a eukaryotic biologist, you probably have all these uh, ratios in, in your head, like 70% of the human cell count is represented by red blood cells. Gilio, uh, go ahead, Elio. Well, uh, I think we've, we've probably dealt with it sufficiently. Let me just tell, bring up one more point. Uh, lastly, uh, if you look at numbers of cells, you have one thing, but if you look at the number of genomes and the amount of genetic information, there's another number there, namely the bacteria, regardless of numbers, regardless of ratios, represent much, much more genetic information than the human body does. There are about 30 times more genes in the microbiome than in the humans. I don't know what that means, and I don't really know where it comes from, but if you like numbers, you know, that comes up. Absolutely. Here, a couple of things I wanted to point out, which are really interesting. They make the point in the discussion that every time you defecate, you lose about a third of your colonic bacteria, and that changes the ratio for exactly. a bit, about you know a third. And when you have a colonoscopy, of course, you clean out your colon, and for a day or so, over, right. you have to start over. So you, th- this ratio of one to one can be flipped depending on what's going on in you. So I think that's very interesting. It, yep. It's a fascinating paper. It's it's fun to read. It's easy. Well, are you to sure read. it's fascinating, Michael? I'm going <laughs> to challenge you on that. I, 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 I don't I think like, it's fascinating. I like to think about numbers. Um, well, yeah, but you know these numbers are squishy themselves because oh, yeah. of the things we talked about. But the problem they, is, they, 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 we can come up with a number, but it doesn't mean anything. They're squishy. Nevertheless. The, the world has accepted this ratio, and that's why this paper made, made a big that's splash. True. All the yeah, papers. It, it sanity. The sanity argument is real. So the papers yes. are all saying, the news is all saying, you know, 10 to 1 ratio debunked as if it were fact, right? But it was yeah. based on squishy data. It's very interesting how, when hypotheses are overturned, that the press really likes that. I don't know why in science they, they like to do that, but. This was another example of that. But in this case, the original 10 to 1 wasn't even based on good data. So this is much better. The next paper is it's better. More, <laughs> more to my liking. <laughs> I think it was important to make this point. Um, and if you're interested in the different kinds of cells, this would be an interesting paper for you. And you can go get it at our bioarchive. It's there for everyone to uh, check out. All right. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. I thought of a good title couple of oh, good, good titles. One, in in reference to Alio's orig- original blog post, we could call this a, a power of one. A power of okay. one. Okay. Hey, okay. Or we That's could better. call it an inventory of cells. 
I'm no, it's like a, dull. Do you like a power of one? A power, power of, of one. one. I like that. Okay. This episode of TWIM is brought to you by the ASM Grant Writing Institute Online Seminar. Actually, it's a webinar. You can stay at home and participate. That's what that means. You do it on your computer. This is for graduate students, postdocs, and early career scientists. You can apply for the ASM Grant Writing Institute online webinar series. This is all about getting an overview of the grant writing enterprises, all how we make our livings nowadays, writing grants and getting support for our research and for us. And so you're going to get an overview of how to make yours better, especially if you're early career. That's who this is aimed at. You will hear about discussions of writing NIH and NSF grants and viewing the grants from the reviewer's perspective. What does a reviewer think about what you're writing? It's obviously important because they're going to score it and that's going to depend on whether you get funded or not. This is a six-part series. It begins in March and goes through June. You have to apply to get in and the deadline for applying is February 10th, not too far off. So if you're interested, if you're a grad student, postdoc, or an early career scientist, and you want to hone your grant writing skills, you should apply for this. Go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash A-S-M-G-W-O 16. So B-I-T dot L-Y slash, then all one word, A-S-M-G-W-O 16. Now you think about it, G-W-O is grant writing online, A-S-M-G-W-O 16. Check it out, and we thank them for their support of TWIM. All right, our next paper is a little more data, generating data, because the other paper was actually collecting it. And this is published in Science Magazine. The authors are Sakimoto, Wong, and Yang, and they are from Berkeley, California. And it's called Self-Photosensitization of Non-Photosynthetic Bacteria for Solar to Chemical Production. Now, when I looked at this paper, I said, I really love it. But can I do it? And I, and I was actually determined to do this so I would learn the subject. It's always a challenge for me to well, learn. That's noble. That's really noble of you. I, I really like learning things. And doing a podcast makes you learn something. Otherwise, you sound like a jerk, right? Absolutely. <laughs> you never sound like a jerk. No, thank you. Thank you. My, you should tell my wife that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... The background for this is, as everyone knows, we would like to make more things biologically by biological processes like biofuel and other things so that we don't have to use fossil fuels, which are slowly going away. And of course, when you burn fossil fuels, you make carbon dioxide and other things, and this is not good for the earth. Now, at the moment, we do some fermentation processes to make to take organic matter and make biofuels. You could take corn and make ethanol, for example, out of it, but you produce CO2 in the process, and this is not good. Now, microbes, of course, always do things better, and there are, there are a whole range of microbes, not just bacteria, but archaea and cyanobacteria that can take carbon dioxide and molecular hydrogen, that's H2, and they can use these to produce biofuels, okay? And people have done these reactions in big bioreactors, for example, uh, certain kinds of bacteria called acetogens. These are acetate-forming bacteria. You can put these in a bioreactor and give it CO2 and molecular hydrogen. And anaerobically in the dark, these bacteria will produce acetate by a pathway called the wood lung doll pathway. This is a pathway that does not require energy. You just put in CO2 and molecular hydrogen. You can make acetate. You can also make ethanol, butanol, butyrate, and a variety of other things. So the problem is the hydrogen that you have to give for this process, you know, hydrogen is not easy to store and transport. You have to be careful or, or it will blow up <laughs> and it's expensive to make it. So how do we get around this? Well, it turns out that these same bacteria, these acetogens, can accept electrons in an electrical current. So what you're doing with these bacteria when you give them hydrogen, those are a source of electrons that are needed to power the reaction to produce acetate from CO2. It turns out that these bacteria can accept electrons in an electronic current. In fact, if you have an anode and a cathode and a current running from the anode to the cathode, you can grow the bacteria on the cathode 
they will accept electrons from the anode and use those to reduce carbon dioxide to make acetate. This is basically a microbial fuel cell. And the electrons that you are passing from the anode to the cathode, they can be, of course, produced by a battery, or they could be produced by wind or solar power. Okay, so you could power this fuel cell in many ways. But the problem with these, although in theory they sound great, the performance is limited, the efficiency is limited, they're hard to set up. So this is sort of the way to go to somehow use electrons produced, say, by the sun to power these reactions, but we have to do better. And that's what this paper is about. And this paper explores whether you could use solar energy and deliver it directly to a bacteria. And what they do is they engineer an acetogenic bacterium. It's called Murella thermoacetica. It's an acetogenic bacteria. It will take carbon dioxide. It used to be a clostridium, by the way. It used to be a clostridium. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Clostridium thermoacetica? Acido, uh, ba, 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 ba. look it up. Hold on. <laughs> ba, 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 ba. That's a good one. I like that. Mm. Acetogenic bacteria. All right. So these guys will normally take CO2 and hydrogen, but in this case, they don't want to give it hydrogen. They want to know, can we give it sunlight and that will be converted to electrons? So how would you convert sunlight to electrons? Well, that's what a solar panel does. It uses a semiconductor surface, which absorbs light and uses it to generate, takes light, which is photons, and uses it to generate an electric current. So they do something which I, f I just think is brilliant. It's probably been done before, but for me, this was so cool. They take this bacterium and they grow it in the presence of cadmium and cysteine. Okay, cysteine mm. Cysteine's an amino acid. And what this does, they just grow the bacterium in the presence of these two Cadmium, of course, is, a, is an element, and cysteine is an amino acid. It causes the production of cadmium sulfide nanoparticles that deposit on the surface of the bacteria. And they can see these by scanning electron micrography. They're rather small nanoparticles. They're less than 10 nanometers in diameter. So these are basically— so, This is so amazing. I got I to gotta <laughs> tell you, when I read it, I couldn't believe it. You uh, dope bacteria with yeah. a mineral, and you make them into photosynthesizers. That's right. They're changing My these bacteria. God, it's just they're beyond putting, belief. Think of it this way. They're putting solar panels on the surface of the bacteria, right. right? Without chlorophyll. Without chlorophyll. That's, That's right. right. So you're making it, taking a non-photosynthetic bacterium. It's in the title. And you make it into a photosynthesizer. Yeah, it's very cool. Wow. So now you have these nanoparticles on the surface. They shine light on them, and what happens, uh, the cadmium sulfide absorbs a photon, and then it produces what, what's called an electron and a whole pair. You know, everyone knows what an electron is. A whole pair is basically comes from semiconductor science. It's the absence of an electron. And the electron that's produced generates a reducing equivalent, which then is passed on to the, to the wood Lungdal pathway, and that is the pathway that can synthesize acetic acid from carbon dioxide. So the light is making what's necessary to drive this uh, acetic acid producing pathway. And eventually cysteine is quenching the, the hole. So you get an electron and a whole pair. The cysteine quenches the hole. It is oxidized to cysteine. Cysteine gets oxidized to cysteine uh, when, the, when the cadmium sulfide uh, absorbs the light. And so eventually you run out of cysteine uh, and the reaction stops, but it works. And I'll tell you in a moment how they show that. And the cool thing, all you need is this cat is you need the, the cadmium, the cysteine and the bacteria and, and carbon dioxide. You don't need any light. I'm sorry. You don't need any hydrogen, molecular hydrogen. You do need light to drive this process. And so this is cool because these bacteria normally drive this reaction in the dark uh, with CO2 and hydrogen, but now you can get rid of the hydrogen and use light instead. So these are basically semiconductors on the surface of the bacteria or solar panels. So here's what they do. They make these bacteria with the nanoparticles, uh, and then they add light, and they show that they will make acetic acid. If you take away the light, the acetic acid goes down. Interestingly... Well, actually, not as much as you think. It doesn't go as much as you think, but... 
it does go down when you take the light away. If you take away the cadmium sulfate, it doesn't make acetic uh, acetate either, which they're just trying to show that the acetate production is dependent on light and the cadmium sulfide particles. Uh, what's cool is that when you um, take light away from these bacteria, the viability also decreases, which suggests, now normally these bacteria don't like light, but if this suggests that the solar panels on the surface are actually protecting the bacteria from from dying, which would be be shown as a decrease in viability. So it's very well. They're cool. taking the electrons. Remember, electrons. Yeah. They're t- they're serving as an electron sink, so they're conferring some fitness right. to the microbe because it ends up making this remarkable thing. The other really cool things is they're sequestering carbon because they're making acetate. Right from carbon dioxide, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a carbon sink. So yeah. this has got really um, sig- significant applications. So they also show that only acetate is made in this reaction, and after about a day and a half, uh, the rate of production of acetate reaches a plateau because you have limiting amounts of cysteine. Remember that's reduced by the the uh, whole pair, the the H plus. Uh, it's reduced by that, so you have less and less cysteine. They find that the yield uh, was 90% acetic acid, and the rest of the reduced carbon dioxide goes towards biomass, gets incorporated into biomass in the bacteria. During photosynthesis, the cell counts double uh, after the first day, and so they say this suggests the possibility of a completely self-reproducing hybrid organism sustained only through solar energy. And then the viability begins to go down after this period of time coincident with depletion of the cysteine. So I guess if they added more cysteine, they could keep the doubling, but they didn't do that. Or engineer the bacterium so that it can produce more cysteine. But Mm. the problem is, is the uh, bacteria in general don't like to overproduce that redox sensitive amino acid. Mm. And so they would have to engineer it such that they would export it outside of the cell. This is a if it used to be Crostridia, so it's gram positive. So unlike the, the the trick would be whether or not it could go into a gram negative, where you would have an outer membrane where you could you know effectively build this machine part. But mm-hmm. being gram positive, um, there's no gift of the outer membrane. So yeah, you're going right. to have to somehow anchor this into the peptidoglycan and somehow couple it either to uh, a lipotychoic they acid. They don't go into where how where where these uh, where the cadmium actually is anchored. They really don't say that, do they? No, no, no. they show yeah. they show an EM. Right. And I was trying to figure out, but it's it's more of a cartoon than than an EM, and so you you really are struggling how to see what it's actually looking like. Yeah, I, I presume that we'll see something in the future about the actual structure of that. And how it interfaces with uh, you, you bet you will. Now they they did a neat experiment where they give more and more blue light, and this increases the rate of acetic acid production up to a plateau, and then it drops, and the drop is accompanied by holes that are punctured in the cell membrane. And eventually, the bacteria are destroyed. So at at some point, you you can't give more light because this causes holes to be made in the membrane. I wonder if selenium would work as well or selenocysteine would work uh, to the same level in efficiency as cysteine because it's mm-hmm. a much with the selenium in there. It's a remember selenium is the active agent in um, xerography mm-hmm. and it takes a photon and it transfers a charge very easily to paper that you then put carbon particles on and, and heat them to make a Xerox print. But at the same time, it's sort of the same principle. You're taking a photon, you're capturing it, and you're transferring it to carbon Mm -hmm. in in the case of CO2. And so I'm wondering if they're married to to cysteine or whether or not they could get um, a two-for-one. Rather than using cadmium, they could do it with um, uh, selenocysteine and, and get rid of the cadmium part and just have the selenium and the cysteine in the same molecule. Um, yeah, that, that's a clever idea. I like that. They, they, I imagine they, they know that. They're, they're fooling yeah. with it, yeah. You know. So th- then they did an experiment, which Alio alluded to earlier. All these experiments, they're using high-intensity blue light. 
So next they said, let's give these bacteria low intensity simulated sunlight and we'll give them light, dark, 12 hour cycles. So it's, it's much less intense. When they did this during the light, the acetic acid concentrations increased. But when they switched to dark, it continued to increase. And this happened for several cycles. And they think that this may be because during the light cycle, the bacteria made, made some biosynthetic intermediates, which then they could use during the dark cycle to continue uh, the, the production of acetate. Well, think how remarkable it is. It's like saying plants photosynthesize at night. Yep. It's cool. Yeah. Their yield of acetic acid was 2.44% of the total incident light. And they say this is comparable to plants and algae. This is remarkable. Here they made a completely artificial system, and it's pretty efficient. It's almost as good as nature <laughs> so far. So they say in the in the discussion, and I want to quote this because I really like this. They say biological roots to solid state materials have struggled to compete with high quality traditionally synthesized materials. So you think about the solar panels on the roofs, which are great at harvesting photons. You know, those are traditionally synthesized. They're not biologically made. But their work shows that biomaterials can be of sufficient quality to do work, to make acetic acid huh. and other things, and they may be more advantageous. They say, for example, when you typically make a nanoparticle, you have to put organic uh, ligands on it to control the shape, and this is a barrier to charge transfer, whereas in the bacteria, you don't need a ligand. You just make cadmium sulfide nanoparticles, and that makes a good interface between the bacteria and the semiconductor, and you get good efficiency. The other advantage of this system is that plants and algae that do photosynthesis, they store the products as biomass, and then you have to take that and process it further to make a chemical. This system, this baby, directs 90% of the photosynthetic products to, to acetic acid, so you don't have to do any post-processing. That's really neat. I understand that. <laughs> so this is a proof of concept. Solar to chemical production in a bacterium that normally doesn't do photosynthesis. Of course, they have to improve many aspects. They have to improve the production rates. They have to scale it up, and they have to make explore other bacteria that produce other compounds, you know, like ethanol, and they maybe can engineer these. So apparently these bacteria are the workhorses uh, of synthetic biology. You can modify genes left and right, and so they could perhaps modify them to make different things from uh, from carbon dioxide. A green method for chemical synthesis, really. I think this is pretty cool. It's amazing. Except for the cadmium part. That's not too green. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Yeah, you're right. I guess I, I added that there, and that, that, that wasn't in the paper, but I just look at it as green. But yeah. No, it's greener than the making, them, the, making the panels. So you're going to buy stock in Morella? <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah, go we're going to have to look for solutions that can, you know, we're all experiencing the effects of global climate change. And we're going to have to figure out clever ways to fix CO2 to help the CO2 conundrum. And we're going to have to, especially for the developing world, figure out easy ways to make um, chemicals that we can uh, convert because you can convert acetate upward to motor fuels. And so you can yeah. do all sorts yeah. of things. And so if you oh. can and, – and it was producing a reasonable amount. I mean only 2% was going to biomass and the rest was, was coming out, if I'm remembering Vincent's statement right. Yeah, in the acetic acid, 90%. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah cool. so – and it's chirally perfect acetic acid. It's not a – it's not coming from oil where it's gooey and you know got all sorts of contaminants. <laughs> this, is, this is pure synthesis by the microbe. Uh, I was surprised to read, to see because obviously I don't I know nothing about this that there is quite a literature about the mineral part of the study. Yes, uh, and uh, so there is quite a bit of stuff done about um, the, the the chemical basis for this, and so this paper really just put that together with biology. Yeah, exactly. That's remarkable. Tell me. If if somebody had told you about this before reading the paper as a possibility, would you have thought it's possible to take no. a perfectly decent clostridium-like <laughs> bug and turn it into a photosynthesizer? No. Never. But that's the kind of thing you're always surprised at. And then you look back and say, yeah, I should have seen it, but you can't. Yeah. It, oh, this is amazing. This is a disruptive technology that we just witnessed the birth of. I do think so. I think it is disruptive. Yeah. The thing is that, you know, people have been exploring this 
a lot in algae. But mm-hmm. as they say here, they take the photosynthesis and they make biomass out of it. And you have to process it. Here comes out as a chemical. A motor fuel. A motor fuel. <laughs> so what do you do with acetate, Michael? We all know how to break down things to acetyl-CoA, and you can just build it the other way around. You can right. make, you just start adding the two carbons together, and you can make motor fuel relatively easily. Yep. Anyway, very cool paper. Yep. All right. Thank we, you very much. We, Vincent, um, that was really neat. Uh, yeah, Actually, for the virologist, you're a pretty good bacterial physiologist. Uh, <laughs> I, I learned from you. Oh, really? I read, oh, your, I re- I read your book. Ah, the, I'll do uh, it every day. Microbe, and I'm waiting for the new one because I want to learn more. And it's coming out. I have it's to tell you, out. the person who handed me this article, he actually had torn it out of his science magazine because he's, he's Dixon de Pommier, who still gets a subscription to the physical magazine. And he came <laughs> in, he said, look at this. This is amazing. And so I have to thank Dixon, my uh, co-host on TWIV and TWIP, for pointing that out to me. It's great. Thank him for us, please. This episode of TWIM is also brought to you by the 32nd Clinical Virology Symposium. Abstract submission is now open for this meeting, which takes place from May 19th through the 22nd in Daytona Beach, Florida. Of course, May is nice all over the place in the U.S., so it's not so great to go to Daytona Beach at that time, but it's still good. It's Florida, it's sunny, and there's a Clinical Virology Symposium for you to learn from. You can submit your abstract, deadline is March 17th, to talk about your latest research. What about things like rapid viral diagnosis, the clinical course of viral infections, and preventative and therapeutic approaches for preventing virus infections. And there'll be over a thousand people at this meeting, including researchers and primary care physicians. So if you're interested in clinical virology, you should apply. Go to asm.org slash cvs2016, asm.org slash cvs2016. We thank ASM for their support of TWIM. All right, we have a couple of very interesting emails for you. First is from Gene, who writes, Dear TWIM, with regard to the question about culturing gut microbes from Drosophila, this is something that came up a couple of episodes ago. I was lucky enough to take a sabbatical in the lab of Dr. Angela Douglas, in the fall of 2012, where I worked on the gut microbiota of Drosophila. Her lab found that diversity of gut microbes in lab-reared Drosophila is quite low, comprising just five to six taxa, almost entirely lactobacillus and acetobacter. Low diversity bacterial community in the gut of the fruit fly Drosophila was published in Environmental Microbiology. These are easily culturable, although they grow better in low oxygen environments. Cultivation techniques for these bacteria can be found and she gives a link to that. She's a professor of biology at Mansfield University. Now, you know, so this they can be cultured from Drosophila. It's quite interesting. This makes me wonder, Michael, so this one-to-one ratio, do you think this is for all species that have bacteria, or do you think it's variable? I would predict that it's all about networking. And my suspicion is, is if we can get at the true number of microbes that are doing things with the host, Going back to Stanley's argument of mutualism, I think that number is going to hold pretty well to one to one. You could easily do that in a, fl- in a fruit fly. You could actually take yeah. all the contents and count them if you in, in a um, a coulter counter, right? Uh, yeah, hemocytometer. People or, still use those things. They use hemocytometers and they use uh, uh, Hoxley cell counting chambers yeah. and mm. all sorts of wonderful things. Cool. Next one is from Steve who writes, hi, microbif- microbophiles. That would be us. Happy New Year and happy birthday to Vincent. Thank you. I have to say it was good to hear a TWIM, number 118, where I understood every word. Having been a mushroom collector in my time, it was like revising the morphology section right down to the sterigmata. So there you go, Elio, another collector. How about that? Another picker. As opposed I'm, glad to to hear, I'm glad to hear I'm not the only one. <laughs> I had often wondered there how plenty, the, there are plenty of mushroom collectors. I had often wondered how the spores managed to stop and fall down between the gills, but perhaps the air viscosity is sufficient, as Elio says. A further point to note may be that the mushroom cap is elevated on the stipe so as to get the spores above the lamina airflow that hugs the ground, close to and into the turbulent air that carries them aloft. You might also observe that the gills are always gravitationally aligned, even if mm. the stipe is bent. 
the spores have to be able to fall down unimpeded. Where it comes the wedge, to the, the gills in most mushrooms are wedge shaped, mm-hmm. so that that helps the ones on top clear the the surface of the gill below. So they're wider at the bottom. You mean? No, the wider at the top. I see. The gills are wider at the top, and they taper down mm-hmm. so that the, at the end of the gill, it's 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 much narrower. When you think about it. That's a way of the ones on top. If they were just to fall, in fact, they would clear. That gill. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where it comes to the assertion of the importance of fungal spores to cloud formation, I have to refer you back to your program on e and other phytoplankton where we were told that the production of dimethyl sulfide as a result of breakdown of sulfur-containing metabolites was the key to controlling the world's weather as the DMS leads to the formation of sulfate aerosols that act as nucleation foci for water droplets much as the fungal spores are mooted to do in today's podcast. I guess it's both probably, right? I think that's great because there are really two ways in which microbes influence the weather. I'm not talking about climate, I'm talking about weather. And that's exactly what Stephen is the writer. Stephen says, yep. namely, uh, one is, is a particulate matter, and it's not only fungal spores. We emphasize fungal spores, but bacteria do it too. Uh, i not sure about this, but I think they're about equal in importance. And the other is by making chemicals which become nucleating agents themselves. So there are two grand ways in which microbes influence the weather. Uh, he continues, without reading into this before writing, while it's still fresh in my mind, I would suspect that as they are derived from molecular processes, the aerosol particles may be smaller than even the fungal spores and give more nucleation foci per cubic meter than obtained from even the large number of spores mentioned. So on the whole, I think I'm more inclined to stick with the phytoplankton than the mushrooms in importance as rainmakers, though I think that almost any dust particle, including spores, will act as a nucleus too. Or do the sulfate aerosols need particles to condense on just as the water vapor does? Well, that may be true, Stephen. Exactly. That's what I'm thinking. Many thanks for all your great podcasts, and I look forward to many more in the new year, especially as I have now caught up with the story so far on Twiv, Twim, and Twip. Yeah, he's listened wow. to all of them. Good. 370 Twivs, 119 Twims, and 100 Twips. That's wow. A That's a lot. Over, is that 500? Yeah. Good job, Steve. Steve's from England. And we have another Steve writes, Twim is one of my top three podcasts. An excellent way to relax. Thanks for a great job. I enjoyed Buller's Drop, Fungal Spore Ejection, and Discussions of Potential Life on Mars. But what about some discussion of life in Earth's subsurface, where most microbes on in Earth live at depths down to several kilometers and at very low metabolic rates? They play a major role in geochemical cycles and natural resource formation. Paper below is an old one from Casey Hubert at UOC, UConn, and talks about uh, bacterial spore transport and so on. I think survival and transport of microorganisms within and between planets would make an interesting episode for readers discussion in more detail of microbial survival on interplanetary transport and landing via meteorites would also be interesting, which you touched on in this spore slash Mars episode. Thanks and best wishes. So the EC sends a reference to a paper in science, a constant flux of diverse thermophilic bacteria into the cold Arctic seabed. Mm, interesting. Lots of, yeah. Look into it. These are interesting topics for sure. And I think the topic of microbes in space would be another one, too. We'll keep our eyes out for something good, Steve. Now, if you're interested in microbes in space, the next one is for you. This is from Peter, who writes, Dear Twim Team, I saw this advertisement for a two-year postdoctoral position for a microbiologist at the UK Center for Astrobiology, University of Edinburgh, and I thought it may be of interest to other listeners. I have no connection with the university. This is a two-year position to investigate the behavior of of microorganisms in space using the International Space Station. So I'm going to put the whole job description uh, in the letters. But if you want to look at microbes in space and uh, use the facilities of the space station, I presume you you will send up uh, experiments and not go yourself. You should you should apply for this. That could be fun. Two years, and then when you publish it, we'll talk about your results here on TWIM. That's right. <laughs> Michael, would you go Michael, would you go into the space station to work on microbes? I I've heard it's very interesting. You're the, in young, you're, the of, you're the youngest of us. I I am the youngest. <laughs> uh it's 
I think it w- I would just to experience the lack of gravity for a while. And, you know, they, they sent up that astronaut who has a twin brother on, on earth. And I think they're doing a lot of work on his, his microbes. One of my colleagues who works for a company in town has had a number of experiments on the uh, space station. And he said the microbiology is, is fascinating because, of course, nothing ever comes off. Yeah. They don't like open the windows and, you right. know, air it out. I hear it smells. It smells. That, that in, you know, space does have a smell is what I've been told. All right. Our next one is from Jeffrey who writes, Doctors, first of all, thank you for reading and commenting on my Talmudic question about unleavened bread. I hope that it gets some of your listeners thinking. Second, I had a few thoughts that I thought might or might not help amplify your discussions. One, thanks for the article on amoebic pack hunting. I think I've heard of similar tactics with other microbes. Dr. Rack and Yellow kept referring to nematodes in a negative sense. One nematode function that he particularly picked on was parasitism. I'd like to point out that nematodes are as diverse a group as they are because they occupy nearly every ecological niche available somewhere in the world. While many of them are quite nasty, nearly all are valuable contributors to the environment. Because of the differences in scale, we think we tend to think of plant-eating nematodes as infestations, while we think of plant-eating ungulates as cattle. <laughs> also, think about <laughs> think about the difference or lack of differences inherent in nematodes that graze on bacteria and nematodes that graze on algae. Thinking on their level is probably one of the most fascinating things about this group. I didn't know I was picking on them. I mean, it was probably in jest. You know, I appreciate all of these things on Earth. All right, number two, one of the well, reasons— He's absolutely right. I mean, nematodes have not gotten their— they're a good I'm press. A yeah. yeah, because they, some, they are fascinating. They should be studied much more and they should be understood better. I agree. And if they yeah. tasted like filet mignon, they would have a better <laughs> reputation. Well, you right. know, people study C. elegans a lot, but, uh, you know, many of the other ones are nasty, as he said, and it gives them a bad rep. But, yeah, there are lots of good ones, too. Just like viruses and bacteria get a bad rap, but a lot of them are good. Most of them are good. Most of them are good. All right, number two, one of the reasons that I have a small interest in nematodes is exactly their occupation of so many ecological niches. Dr. DePommier may be interested to know that Dr. Gruel, formerly of Ohio State, has been working on a method to measure soil health by microscopic assays of nematodes in a soil sample. Shows you. Yeah, she goes on to talk about that. Number three, thanks for the article on fungal spore dispersion. I have to say that I disagree with their assessment of evolutionary advantage. I think that, A, being a a point of droplet nucleation would help ensure that the spores could be carried in clouds further than naked spores because naked spores would be subject to more chaotic and therefore shorter paths. Genetic dispersion can be an advantage. B, in the open atmosphere, spores are vulnerable to UV exposure. It seems to me that thicker aqueous coatings could uh, protect. And C, being a rain droplet nucleation site would also help ensure that a spore lands with an initial bolus of water to help initiate sporulation. Yeah, but I don't think they, they land with, uh, with any, with any right water on them. I think this, they probably dry out ahead of time. That's right, yeah. Number four, I suspect there's a lot that we can learn about hydrophobic, hydrophilic meta, metamaterial surface design from studying these spores, that's for sure. Five, much of water droplet formation seems to be based on nucleation site chemistry. That might be the mannitol. This is part of the surface structure of the spore itself, or it might be combination. I saw a little reference to this chemistry in the paper. If they aren't already in talks with someone, I suggest the authors need to collaborate with a meteorological chemist to look at the surface chemistry of the equated and non-equated spores more closely. If this hasn't already been studied in some detail, then the estimates of atmospheric spore concentrations suggest that it should be. Six, in addition to studying spore effects on droplet nucleation in a cloud chamber, I would suggest a potentially less expensive test would be a correlational study between the atmosphere and cloud concentrations of the two types of spores versus rain formation based on mannitol biotracer monitoring. Yeah. And finally, to chime in on Chris's Martian pathogen question, I would say that it might be possible, even if there wasn't a microbial exchange between Earth and Mars, as long as the Martian life form requires carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and water, I can envision a decomposer-type organism which doesn't so much hijack the host body, but chemically decomposes it and scavenges the chemically shattered remnants. It could be something along the lines of acid-based hydrolysis, which would have the added advantage of liberating needed minerals in the Martian soil. 
The bigger question would be if any extremophilic microbial survivors on Mars could survive the relative superabundance of water in Earth organisms. Such extremophilic organisms might also grow so slowly as to be swamped out by the abundance of life in most Earth organisms. On the other hand, if a dead body were left on Mars and mostly dried out, then those organisms would be all over the body like bone worms on a whale carcass in the deep blue terrestrial sea. <laughs> Thanks for another stimulating episode. I think we stimulated uh, Jeffrey's uh, mind quite a bit there, don't you? I I think uh, <laughs> he was really blown away by some of it. So that's why questions are good from the from the listeners because they actually stimulate other listeners. Absolutely. All right. The last one is a email from Anthony who sends a letter, uh, an article called what happens to your microbiome if you own a dog. Uh. And of course we all know that our microbiomes are influenced by our surroundings, including not only our family members, our food, but our pets. So I guess you acquire some of your, some bacteria from your dog, right, Michael? Oh yeah. And Jack Gilbert has published on, on that as well. Um, so it's it's a really fascinating thing. And the Academy is going to come out with a frequently asked question volume in a very short period of time. You're talking about the American Academy of Microbiology, the, right? Correct. The American Academy. Which Acad uh, our colleague Michelle, Michelle Swanson, Swanson is the chairman. That's He's the president <laughs> of it. Yes. And so that's going to come out fairly shortly. And it's uh, microbes in the built environment. And – that's one of the fun facts for future figuring is, you know, pets actually can change the way you look microbially. Hmm. Well, on that note, we shall wrap up this episode of TWIM, which you can find at iTunes and at microbeworld.org, also at microbe.tv slash TWIM. And we love to get your questions and comments, especially if we stimulate or pique your imaginations. Twim at microbe.tv. Alio Schechter, you can find at his wonderful blog, Small Things Considered. Thank you, Alio. My pleasure. This is a lot of fun. And Michael Schmidt is at the sunny Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Where it only rain, it only snows twice a year, is that right? No, twice in twenty five years. <laughs> oh. That's a much better ratio, isn't it? That's a much better <laughs> ratio. But last year we had 75 inches of rain. Mm, that's good. The Californians would kill for that or a, frag a tenth of that. Yeah. We should be growing all our food crops in South Carolina. We should. Mm. We actually do grow quite a bit. But you're not as big as California. That's no, unfortunately. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology. WS. I would like to thank the American Society of the Microbiology for their support of TWIM, in particular Chris Gandayan and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.